I'm counting down what I think are the top 10 best costumes from Game of Thrones Season 7 coming up. Welcome to Costume Co. I do weekly videos where I analyze costumes from many of your favorite shows and movies. So if this is something you're interested in, consider subscribing and hit the bell notification icon. Warning, there will be major spoilers for the entire seven episodes of Game of Thrones Season 7. So please don't watch this unless you have taken in the whole season. It's been two months and lots of withdrawal since the last episode of Game of Thrones aired. As many of you know from watching my Season 7 recap videos, I thought that Season 7 was too dark and so much so that many of the details on the costumes were sometimes indecipherable. This is only more apparent when you see the shill shots of the costumes under normal light. Vox even did an analysis of 67 episodes and determined that season 7 was the coolest season of them all. It's a shame that we have to wait to see all of the details of the costumes after the episodes have aired. There were a few bumps and hiccups along the way, but despite that, I thought it was a pretty solid season. So let's get on with the countdown. The men look great in season 7, perhaps better than the women in some cases, and Sir Jorah Mormont was no exception. For the last six seasons, Jorah has been living in exile in Essos, forced to wear the same old costume for the last few seasons. And seriously, I hope they burned that damn shirt after that nasty grayscale operation. Partway through season 7, Jorah got a brand new set of armor, all in chocolate brown. The showrunners kept Jorah and his new duds out of the promos for good reason, so it was a wonderful reveal to see him looking so fine. The first thing we see, of course, is this lovely Roman-style cape. It looks like linen, but it might be raw silk or perhaps a blend of the two. And I know it's very long and full because you can see where they seamed the panels together. Here's a shot of Jorah saying goodbye to Danny, and you can see that his sleeves have rows of bear-type fur between the bands of leather strips. And one thing I've noticed about Clapton is once she finds a technique that she likes, she uses it in multiple costumes, like the bands of feathers on Sansa's costume. And while he hasn't completely become his father, his costume does play homage to Gior's bare fur collar and plated armor. Gior, of course, was in Sala Black, being the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Here's a good shot of the top of Jorah's studded armor, presumably made from boiled leather or queer bouli, which is a technique used in the Middle Ages that created a moldable, rigid armor. It appears that the cuirass or armor is a solid piece with plates riveted on top. However, with a, without getting a good close-up of the costume, I'm not sure if the plates are metal or leather. And the leather and armor work this season have been astounding. In a behind-the-scenes video, actor Ian Glenn is revealed to be wearing this jerkin with detachable sleeves under his armor. A bit of a signature for Jorah, he always wears some type of knotted scarf around his neck, like this black and gold one seen here, a little bit of bling for Danny. And you can see in the lighting that there is an incredible amount of breakdown, which only really works in the dimly lit show. One of the things that Clapton does exceptionally well as a designer is all of these layers and textures that give the costumes depth. The camera has a tendency to flatten the costume, so what might look great in person won't translate well to your TV screen, even if it's in high def. In previous videos, I mentioned that Michelle Clapton attempted to save money in the budget by having replaceable sleeves, like we see here on Jorah. His other sleeves are bare fur, while these are bands of leather, which is more appropriate for the temperate climate of King's Landing. You can also see that Jorah's armor has fods, or hip protectors. Gendry's costume is on this list because while it was simple and rustic, it's also beautifully crafted. The tunic is made of leather, it's bound with leather around the collar and armholes, and then it's grommeted and fastened with leather lacing. 
Gandry's Warhammer features the Baratheon sigil, the stag. And this is important because with the exception of Gendry, House Baratheon is actually legally extinct. Here's his weapon in a photo shoot from Making Game of Thrones. It's a good strong design, said weapons master Tommy Dunn, adding, it has the House Baratheon design sculpted with the stag sigil on either side. The yellow ochre color of his vest is a nod to his father, Robert Baratheon. Here's a shot of the apron, of course, which he takes off before departing with Davos and his heavily soiled shirt. I think that the shirt has a collar, but it's been tucked into his coat. The vest portion of the coat has a center back seam that gives the coat some shaping, since the only other seams are at the side and waist. In this shot, you can see the heavy soiling and breakdown on the costume. In this image, you can see Gendry's leather wrist cuffs, and you can also see the pleated skirt peplum on the coat. Next up on the list is Arya Stark, the estranged sister returning home. We saw her transition throughout season seven. And as many of you know, I wasn't crazy about the Sansa and Arya story arc, but costume wise, I think she came full circle. Here is an awesome close up of the costume from Making Game of Thrones. The brown leather jerkin has detachable sleeves and the quilting is similar to the one worn by Arya's father, Ned Stark. And a fun fact, a quick and easy way to reinforce a hole in fabric, metal grommets didn't come into popular use until the 1800s and were first used in women's corsets. Before that, metal eyelets or hand-sewn eyelets were utilized. In this close-up, of course, we see Arya's sword needle and her newly acquired Valyrian steel dagger. Here's Michelle Clapton's sketch of Arya with a fur-lined cape and leather tab skirt, and then, of course, Arya's final transformation. In this shot from an HBO promo, we get a better look at the cape. It's almost like a Greek clamus, the way this asymmetrical garment is worn over the head with one arm slipping out. It's fastened, again in an asymmetrical fashion, on the leather shoulder bit with lacing. Clapton often binds stress points like this, in leather or suede. The cape is lined in a mottled fur and the cape fabric itself is a gray knit wool or mohair. Aria has her own look adapted from Winterfell, Michelle Clapton said, but the cut of her cape is quite different from the old Winterfell stuff, so that's something which is very much her look that she brought with her. Here's a good look at her leather belt. It's overly long and it's been double wrapped around the tiny waist and fastened with a brass buckle. The belt is bordered with a tooled rope style pattern detailing and it's distressed. Clapton said in an interview with Inquirer, now that Arya's home, I took her father's style as inspiration. With Arya, I wanted an element of elsewhere to represent her journey, so I chose to design an asymmetric cloak that is perfect for fighting and sleeping in. It's exclusive to her style. Arya's square pattern on her coat is reminiscent of her father Ned Stark's costume, namely his gambeson, which he wore as a protective undergarment. Clapton said, Arya has adopted some of Ned's shapes, but again, she's brought her own take on it as well because she's got elements of her life that she's had so far. YouTube viewer Althea pointed out to me that Arya's square motif is also reflective of the House of Black and White, the temple in Bravos dedicated to the many-faced god. You can see that the 3D grid pattern doors behind her look similar to the ones on her cape. Viewer Lovey Dovey, meanwhile, also mentioned that it looks like the squares that hold the faces in the Hall of Faces. According to viewer Nina H., the gray woolen textile used for Arya's cape is a woven fabric. She says, and I'm quoting her here, to be more precise, it looks like a waffle weave where you achieve the long floats which create the grid-like pattern. It's been probably done very loosely and in a nice thick yarn. I think you can't achieve the effect of the grid being so pronounced with a knit very easily. Here's a look at the skirt from a photo shoot done earlier in the year for Entertainment Weekly. By episode seven, Aria arrived at this final look of the season, finally landing on this quilted leather jerkin with detachable sleeves and leather tab skirts. 
This look is full stark. Arya is channeling not only her father Ned, but Rob and Jon Snow as well. The leather skirt has the same pattern like we saw on the door in the House of Black and White. Here's a close-up of the skirt. The top layer is custom leather work that looks hammered or maybe even cut and then it's heavily distressed to give it this mottled appearance. By the weight, it looks like it's sandwiched to another piece of leather and then bound with a contrasting leather. Here's another close-up shot that include her boots that look kind of like a cavalry riding boot or in Canada we might call them Mountie boots. On the left is an example of a top lace interwar USMC boots from the 1920s or 30s and on the right is an example of a pair of side lace US office cavalry boots from World War I. There's little doubt that Jon Snow is the hero in the story and he dressed the part, finally embracing his legacy with this King of the North traditional Stark style armor topped off with a floor length cape and wolf pelt. One thing that has merged and appears to be a sign of status or even wealth is the size of the pelt and Jon undoubtedly has the largest. And while Jon channels his late uncle Ned, Although still believing him to be his father, John is making his own way, and we can see this through his costume too. In season six, John was in browns like Ned Stark and wore this beautiful velvet jacquard cloak made by Sansa, seen on the right. But this season, John's coat of plates is now black. Clapton has stated in interviews that she's pulled color from the palette of the show because everything is becoming more serious. So this season, John's new floor-length cloak is trimmed in fur to reflect the drop in temperature, but perhaps also the changing political climate as well. Here is a close-up of his cape. I actually was surprised to see that it's unlined. The woven fabric is slightly a loose weave. You can see this because the light shines through it although the entire thing appears to be considerably heavy despite that. And another thing is you can see that they dyed the bottom portion of the cape to look at, make it look more distressed. John's metal gorget, or collar, is in two sections and it's fastened at the shoulder with leather straps. The piece is decorated with two raised direwolves facing each other and it's trimmed at the neck with leather. He's wearing his coat of plates over a leather lined quilted gambeson. Michelle Clapton said in an interview of this decision of losing the cape for his meeting with Danny, we had a lot of discussions about does the cape give him presents or is it better to not have the presents? What are we trying to say? There are times when we removed it because we wanted him to be more vulnerable. And she adds, especially I think when he saw Danny, he went to see her for the first time in her chamber. We decided to remove it, but then when he went to see Cersei, we put it on. In this scene, at the request of Missande, John has removed his sword and sword belt to meet Daenerys. With the exception of the color, you can see how close John's armor is to his father Ned, both when he was young and old. Hard to believe, but Sansa had only three gowns this season. In fact, without looking too closely, you'd probably be hard pressed to tell them apart. And despite that, this look from the season premiere was my favorite and the one that I think encapsulated her entire journey up to now. Clapton said in an interview with Harper's Bazaar, Sansa, she's been abused, raped, and had the most horrific things happen to her. So I like the idea that she enca she's encased in her costume. No one is going to get into her. No one is going to get near her. Clapton said in another interview with Inquirer, I loved Sansa's dresses in season seven. There was a balance of precision and structure with the idea that she is being wrapped up, laced in, and protected. There is a sense of security. Sansa has incorporated a few elements from her dark Sansa look, including her needle pendant, this one now silver and missing the crossbar. Clapton tells Harper's Bazaar, the chain in a weird way is an influence from Littlefinger. He always used to wear accoutrements from his job, chained to his coat on a fine chain, and then a mockingbird sigil at his neck. So I was trying to collate all the people who influenced her, whether she likes them or not. There's a real formality about her chain and the way the circle is positioned and looped. That's very much Littlefinger. 
In this close-up image on the left, you can see the fur trim cuffs on her gown, and on the right, the raven feather trim on her bodice. Michelle Clapton told the Huffington Post, The cut of the costume was very fitted and severe, but the fabrics were soft, textured, and quilted. I was trying to grasp all that has happened to Sansa, all the hurt and abuse and frustration, and trying to understand how she would express this, yet appear strong. She adapts all she has learned to her look. Rooney Mara wore this stunning Valentino gown on the October cover of Vogue with the bodice a similar cut to Sansa's gown. However, it's just a coincidence since this is from Valentino's 2017 spring show. Here's a close-up of the neck roll covered in feathers and finished off with two direwolf clasps. You have to look closely, but there are these nondescript feather embroidery stitches on her Japanese-style collar. Many of these details were lost under the dimly lit sets. If you look closely at Sansa's leather belt, you'll notice that it's not entirely black, but a mottled oxblood color. Of Sansa's belt, Clapton said, This is her taking back control of her body. I designed it to wrap around over her side lace dress to represent the absolute removal of any possible physical touch. Her dresses are also tightly laced on, incredibly difficult to remove. It's a message to Littlefinger. Danny opened the season in this Targaryen-inspired costume. I picked it over the other costumes because it is so beautifully made, and I preferred this symmetrical cut over her other wrap-style dresses. While it might be surprising, the silhouette Clapton explains purposely echoes that of the Targaryen style that her brother wore in season one. Danny wore a version of this costume in last year's season finale. The cut of this dress with the falling sleeves was a repeated look throughout season six. Here's a close-up look at the costume taken from embroiderer Michelle Carragher's website. You can see the detail of the beaded dragon on the upper sleeves and the North American smocking iron flat to look like dragon scale. This spiky copper sequin on silk chiffon from Top Fabric of Soho is what gave the dragon embroidery its unique texture. It's crazy expensive, however. It's 150 pounds per meter, but as you can see, production used very little. For the arrival in Dragonstone, Clapton's team modified the costume. They added this Japanese-style collar and sleeves. Pretty clever because it appears to be an entirely new costume. Clapton tells Harper's Bazaar, with Danny, the colors have gotten darker, but there's a red creeping in. Her house color, slowly we're trying to move them into their own individual looks. It's practical, it's war, the time isn't for pretty dresses. Jewelry isn't worn to be attractive. It's worn to represent your house or your stature or your intent. This is the direction I have to go in now. Michelle Carragher added additional spiky copper sequins along the edge of the collar and beads in the shape of a dragon claw at the base of the collar. In an interview, Clapton told Insider, I wanted this season to close down color-wise, except that Danny now she's just getting a little bit of red coming into her costume. She's finally claimed her throne. Well, she's on her way to claiming her throne. And if you look closely, you can see that Carragher has layered gray and red feather stitch embroidery on the gown and collar and incorporated some red Swarovski crystal beads to catch the light. Here's an example of some sew-on 8mm round Swarovski crystals from Etsy. And while these crystals might cost more than your average Austrian crystal, they're superior in the way that they sparkle and they also will hold their luster over time. To complement the look, Danny wears one piece of jewelry, this silver dragon hair adornment hairpin. Sort of out of left field and his way to woo Queen Cersei, Euron season seven rockstar outfit caused quite the Twitter storm. And while it was a bit too much for me, given all the black leather from season seven, I still believe it deserves a place in my top 10 best costumes of season seven. From the outset, it might not make complete sense, but actor Pilu Aspect tells HBO that 
Michelle and I did the whole effing rock star look. Leather pants, leather jacket, open shirt, because Euron doesn't give a crap. Clapton herself described the Ironborn King as a psychopathic arse and explained she designed his new look to reflect this. The slashed leather jacket is linked to the slashed front of the Greyjoy armor, but his is methodical, repetitive. In an interview with Independent, Clapton said, The leather jacket is us veering away from the classic slash front of the Greyjoy's armor and just sexing it up a little bit. It's very 1980s rock star. You have to have that swagger in there because he's a complete loony. I think the other thing was I really wanted him to be attractive. If he's going to woo Cersei, there's no point in sending someone in there with a wooden crown and sloppy costume because then Jamie wouldn't feel threatened. Jamie's always stuffed in his armor and isn't very playful. And then you have this man who is everything he can't be. And Pilu was so into it, he definitely brought it to life. He was rocking that look. Clapton adds that the look is meant to intimidate. He wants his look to get inside Jamie's head, to threaten him visually and physically. He's attractive and swaggering. He is a threat. It's likely that Euron's star-cut leather jacket fabric comes from leather producers D'Alessio Galliano in Rome, Italy. They also produced the fabrics for Cersei's season 6 finale gown and also some of Tywin's leather coats. Personally, I prefer the ensemble together with his black overrobe, seem here upon his second arrival to King's Landing with his gifts in tow. You can see that at the back that it has this midi style boat collar, just like the ironborn sailors that rescued Theon. And here, that it drapes in like a scarf-like fashion in the front while cascading at the back. Here's a close-up shot of Euron's costume from making Game of Thrones, and while I think this might be a stretch, even if many sailors have a skill set for sewing, Clopton stated he systematically cut the tongues out of his crew, so I think he did this to his jacket himself. The overcoat looks like dyed and waxed canvas, kind of like sailcloth, and in the close-ups you can see the hand stitching similar to the hand sewing on the Wildling costumes worn by John and the North of the Wall party. Cersei's costumes were a bit of a letdown for me this season. You know, so much black, so much dark. But of all her looks this season, I thought that the cut, fabrication, and decoration of this gown made it worthy of a top spot in my top 10 list. So color aside, I love the cut of it. A very fitted body-hugging torso and sleeves with these pannier folds of fabric at the hip sides. And after looking at some close-ups, I think that the fabric is a matte slub silk. Clapton has her reasons for dressing Cersei all in black. She said, Cersei, now she's just closing down. She's alienating herself. I, however, would have loved to see this costume in a vivid color, but Clapton said, I mean, the first thing I thought when reading the script was, why would Cersei be in a red silk dress right now? It's a time of war as well as winter. This gown, more than any, moves into Mad Queen territory with this almost Disney-style costume, especially this incredibly spiky collar and shoulder detail. Michelle Clapton said, and now, particularly Cersei, she's in this position she's always wanted to obtain, and she's begun emulating her father a little. I mean, with Cersei, I wanted to show this brittleness to her, so I started adding these jagged edges and points to what she was wearing. I'm trying to give clues to their situation to subtly show when the characters are feeling strong, when they are feeling weak. Here's a rear view of the spectacular collar. Now, my only issue with the back of this dress is that it could have used a bit of a, you know, a bit of fullness at the back, like some soft pleated tulle or a bun pad under the dress. You might find that the panniers are similar to Sansa's wedding gown from her marriage to Tyrion. And you might also recall that gown would have been designed by Cersei as well for Sansa. So the connection to me seems logical. Here's a great close-up of the gown. The seams on the dress are really unusual, but it's these armor-like panniers, looking almost like fods or hip guards. I think these folds are likely held in place with tape in the way that Roman shades are, and there is definitely some sort of understructure under the whole thing just to keep it all from sagging. 
But it's this embellishment here that's beyond incredible. I think Clapton said it's supposed to look brittle, like it could break off. The crystal and silver spikes were also used in her other season 7 costume, the one that looks like a dog collar. Sew-on crystal spikes are readily available online, but here's just a variety that I found at Crystal Star Gems. Game of Thrones really needed a showstopper this year, and I'd have to say, hands down, it's Danny's white fur coat. In fact, I'd almost bet that Dave and Dan will submit this episode for best costume at the next year's Emmy Awards. Clapton explains how she came to design this look in a Harper's Bazaar interview. Danny's white coat was quite a big decision. It's such a departure that I think David and Dan luckily trust me enough. They were like, white? You think that's going to work? And I was like, yes, it's really, really, really going to work. They were nervous it would be too much of a statement, but I thought it needed that. It also, It's also incredibly practical. If you're riding a dragon north of the wall, look at what the wildlings wear. Look at what everyone who knows the area wears. In a way, this is Danny's wildling coat. It's a functional piece. They loved it in the end, but sometimes you have to work through ideas and make sure you all understand it. Clapton said of Danny's choice to go north of the wall, I can't think of another time she's gone to the aid of someone else who is also, to some extent, a rival. It had to be a real statement piece. It looks very warrior queen. She's a vision when John looks up and sees her arriving. Here's Clapton's initial sketch of the fur coat taken from her Instagram account. Of the silhouette, Clapton says, it's so easy to lose the person in the layers, especially someone as small as Amelia. That's why the coat is mounted onto a very slender structured base. It would be impossible to use a long fur on her. The contouring of the costume also helps define the shape and the wide shoulders emphasize the small waist. Michelle Clapton tells the Inquirer, the coat is made of fake leather strips, two kinds of fake fur, a long pile high quality fake fur and a short pile white fake fur and some white rabbit fur at the hem. It's basted onto a corset to create the structured shape. The whole process took two to three months to sample and decide the direction, best materials and construction. In this extreme close-up, you can see how the strips of faux fur are attached to one another with a zigzag stitch, which in turn adds to the decoration of the garment. The three-headed dragon, of course, is offset beautifully against the white background. Michelle Clapton told the Huffington Post, I took reference from the Wildlings attire. I wanted to define Danny's shape by cutting into and shaping the fur. Also, I was keen to create a warrior look, a thing of beauty. Now, I'm going to be going off a bit on a tangent here. I just happened upon this razor cut fur technique by chance when doing research on fur for another video, actually. It's the work of French sculptor and designer Marion Chapineau. And her work in fur is inspired from engraving and bas relief techniques. The shaving technique she's invented in 1998 is now copyrighted. And as you can see here, she has worked with established French fashion houses. So this is going to be getting into a bit of un uncomfortable territory for me, but I thought that I'd share this with you that Michelle Clapton never actually reached out to Chopinot to hire her, despite the fact that Chopinot invented the technique. So she said to me by email, why pay someone to copy when you can pay the person who is the originator? And you can actually see that the technique isn't as well crafted as by Chopinot because a cutter is a very different skill set than a sculptor. And according to Michelle Clapton's Instagram, it was a cutter from her team named Linnea who came up with these examples. Now, to be fair, I have no statement from Michelle Clapton herself because honestly, you know, I'm just a small time creator. But in all of the interviews Clapton's done with the highbrow publications, she's not once mentioned Chopinot or the designers that incorporate her technique into their work. While you decide for yourself, if this is a case of inspiration or appropriation, I'll remind you that Michelle Clapton has borrowed rather heavily from the runways before. So this is an all too common practice in the fashion industry. And it's also something that's very difficult to copyright. 
In the case of Marjorie's season two dress, which you might remember I called the human burrito costume, Clapton said that she did take inspiration from Alexander McQueen's Bjork Bell dress. It might not surprise many of you that my favorite costume for season seven is Liana's wedding gown. There are many reasons why I put it at the top of my list. It was a hidden surprise with no leaks or advanced sneak peeks, which made the whole scene that much more dramatic. And the red carpet worthy gown itself is elegant, constructed beautifully from amazing materials with plenty of lovely details. The wedding is set in the warm climate of Dorne, so the gown is in stark, pun intended, contrast to Sansa's winter wedding gown. The Grecian style dress is in this soft green palette of House Stark. In this shot, you can see that the dress is wrapped with bands. Based upon the Greek hymation, French fashion designer Alex Barton made this neoclassic gown popular in the 60s and 70s. This side front image was released after the episode was aired. Here's a close-up of both the dress bodice and skirt seamed at the waist. Stark women traditionally wear no jewelry, but instead embroidered and beaded neck rolls, like we often see on Sansa. But here, Leanne is wearing a silver filigree neck croissant attached to two crossbands. The sheer pleated fabric overlays another gold beaded fabric lining. The crossbands and belt are adorned with these metallic leaves in silver and bronze with additional leaves around the waistline and on the collar. As far as the leaf embellishments go, I had a bit of a hard time finding anything close. So I suspect that they might be vintage because, you know, years ago I, I came across a box of brass leaves that look very similar and they can be sprayed or painted to get the desired patina. I did find these ones, however, by an Etsy seller. Here are a few examples of her findings, but nothing like the ones on Leanna's dress. I'm almost certain that the overlay is made of this soft nylon tulle from Top Fabric of Soho in the color Sea Spray. London-based cement pleating tells me that they pleated Leanna's gown with tree bark pleating, like this sample seen here. And that concludes my top 10 list of the best costumes of season seven. What did you think of my list? Did I miss any of your favorite costumes? If so, let me know in the comment section below. And I'll be bringing more dedicated Game of Thrones videos over the following months to you. So if you like what you see, please like my video and consider subscribing so you don't miss a thing. Thank you so much for watching.